Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you for who you are. You are a heavenly Father. Today we declare it. We love you, Lord. We bless your holy name. And we thank you for the power of your spirit that is in our presence this morning. Have your way in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. So if you didn't get that message, I thought I better repeat it. God knows who you are. I, I didn't get a good amen there. I said, God knows who you are. Out of the 8.1 billion people on planet Earth, God still knows who we are. He knows your name. The writer puts it succinctly reflecting uh, the many scriptures referring to God, our Heavenly Father. If you remember, it says, we have a Father who calls us His own. He never leaves us, no matter where we go. And He knows our name, our every thought. He sees each tear that falls. And hears us, hears our prayers, hears our cries, hears us, hears us when we call. He's the maker who formed us in His heart before even time began the bible declares that our lives were in his hand that is our heavenly father and in jeremiah chapter one he says we are told that before i formed you in the womb i knew you before you were born i set you apart so today as we've heard from angie and and others, Fifi and the team, we celebrate Father's Day. And so let us appreciate our Heavenly Father one more time, the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us appreciate Him, people. Come on! Hallelujah! Father, we give you praise. Lord, we acknowledge all the good that you've done in our lives and thanking you for the purposes and plans that you have for us as you have revealed them in your word now i also join the chorus and wish all the fathers here all the dads potential dads all those celebrating your dads and their legacies a happy father's day happy father's day I, I don't know whether you know the story, but I, I, interestingly, the, you know, fa the origins of Father's Day. Father's Day was invented by Sonora Smart Dot in 1910. Inspired by the establishment of Mother's Day, uh, she wanted to create a similar holiday to honor fathers, especially her own father, William Jackson Smart, a Civil War veteran who raised six children children as a single parent so the first father's day was celebrated in on june 19 1910 in spokane washington in today's service we will focus on adc's fathers in faith if you notice i, I didn't say fathers of faith which are those who have run their journey and completed uh, we find in the bible i said fathers in faith using them as a reference point to reflect on the significant role christian fathers play in our lives and in our communities but let me start first by sharing some of the key attributes you've heard some of them already this morning that the bible talks tells us about our own heavenly father and how some of these attributes need to be translated into our own roles as earthly fathers we know that god is omnipotent we we know that he's all powerful he, he's omniscient he's all knowing uh he's omnipresent we know that present everywhere and he's eternal i, I am not gonna ask the fathers to emulate that 
In addition to all of that, the Bible tells us that our Heavenly Father is holy. And He is just and righteous. He is merciful and gracious. Unchanging. And most of all, the Bible tells us He is a loving Father. He is a loving Father. God is love. And guess what? You also heard it when Angie said it. He said, He desires that His children follow in His footsteps because in doing so, we live fruitful, victorious, and divinely ordained lives. And to support us, He has provided great and precious promises along with His Holy Spirit to guide our every step. What an awesome Father. Today, I have selected seven qualities and principles that Christian fathers are called to emulate from our Heavenly Father. There are many more. I've selected seven. Qualities to ensure a loving and spiritually growing family environment. First, spiritual leadership. A Christian father is to guide his family in faith, prayer, and studying of God's Word, modeling a Christ-centered life, encouraging them to grow in their own relationship with God. Love and sacrifice. Fathers are called to love their families selflessly and sacrificially, as you heard, putting their needs of the wives and children above them. theirs. This is the place where the women say amen. Mm. Listen all. Demonstrating unconditional love and care. The next is teaching and discipline. A Christian father has the responsibility to teach his children biblical values and principles, correcting and disciplining them in the way that is fair, loving, and aimed at their growth and maturity. And then we talk about provision and protection. Christian fatherhood is about providing for the physical, emotional, and spiritual needs of their families. Working diligently to support their families and ensuring a safe and nurturing environment. Encouragement and support. This I find very critical because it goes to my heart. He is to encourage and support his children in their pursuits and dreams while guiding them to align their goals with God's will. I I have a personal story here. We haven't got much time. I have many stories. But this one, we we had a son who who was in second year. He was in his university second year, you know, doing his... uh, a uh, 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 bachelor's in performance, arts and drama and all that stuff. And, and he was also, you know, desiring to be a musician as well. So I, during his second year, he came to us and said, you know what, I, I want to leave, pursue my dreams. Leave university? Yeah. Guess what? As the Bible has told us, we said, well, this is how it works in the kingdom of God. We spent some time in prayer. We taught him how to fast and pray and to hear from God for himself. And we would stand with him. We didn't say, what the hell are you talking about? We just said, listen, just, just, let's spend some time, three days, let's spend some time in prayer. That's when we can hear God. And we prayed with him. And after three days, we said, okay, what are we doing here? He says, I feel peace in my heart to leave. Fathers, <laughs> you know. So, as we followed the principles of God, we said, Hallelujah. Let's go. So, you know what? He left and then went onto his music. He charted his music course, you know, building it up. He was very diligent, worked very hard, had a lot of contractual discussions with Sony and all that stuff. At a certain point, he got frustrated. And he came back and said, this thing is not, you know, I mean, he goes to the States everywhere, doing all that, struggling. 
So I said, again, let's go back to the first principles. We take some time, we fast, we pray, we hear from God. And during that time, he also was living in London, so he started attending Hillsong's church and just supporting, right? As he, as he prayed, he heard, he started a theological program in the University of Oxford. Amen. Not one of the universities I would have chosen, but you know what I mean. But, but. <laughs> he went into Oxford pursuing a theological program whilst he was supporting in the church. Cut a long story short because we have a lot of things to do today. He is now pastor in Hillsong Church UK and he heads all the music and worship in Hillsong UK. Okay. Amen. So to God be the glory. Now we could have killed that at some point. I, I, I will go on. Christian fathers are required to live a life of integrity and faithfulness. This is about faithfulness and integrity to God and His family. Being trustworthy and consistent in word and deed. And finally, a Christian father should exhibit humility, acknowledging his own shortcomings and being quick to seek forgiveness and make amends. He should be able, as an example, to repent and rely on God's grace. All I'm saying here in this last one is that, fathers, it is okay to say, I missed it. I am sorry. It is okay. Now the Bible gives us a number of examples of fathers who've demonstrated some of these principles. Fathers who believed God and strive to walk according to His promises and guidance. Fathers who demonstrated faith through their lives and actions. Fathers of faith as the Bible refers to them. We heard about some of them this morning from Angie Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph are a few of them that I can name. But now it's also important to note that we have fathers today who by faith are trying to emulate our Heavenly Father. Some of them right here in ADC. So can all fathers in ADC please stand? Please stand. Please stand. Please stand. Please stand. Come on, people, you can. Let's celebrate them a bit, eh? Amen. Hallelujah. We thank you. We thank you, fathers. You may be seated. Now I'll be having conversations with some of these fathers who by God's grace and mercy are striving to work by faith. Some of ADC's fathers in faith. We'll be hearing from three groups of fathers. The first group consists of what I call the not so young or the not so old fathers. Hmm? Blessed to be grandfathers. That's the first group. The second group are the fathers with teens or preteen children who I am also referring to as rather than not so young. And the third group is made up of the young fathers who have just begun their fatherhood journeys with young children. And my purpose with the discussions is to have them share some of their lessons so far learned. Remember I said so far learned from their faith journey with God in raising their children. ADC, let us welcome the first group representing our grandfathers in ADC, Yao Osei and Dr. John Azu. Welcome and come on, folks. Come on, folks. I, I, I know your grandfathers. Can you speed it up a bit? Amen. Please grab a seat. That mic's on your chest. Amen. Now, Thank you very much, seniors. In total, between them, there are 11 children, 8 grandchildren, and 2 on the way. Am I right, Dr. You got it. I got it? Hey, I do my research. I do my research. So, with all three of us here, that makes it 15 children, 10 grandchildren, and 2 on the way. I, I have to claim my grandfather position here. Excellent, excellent. Well, in Proverbs 17, 
uh, in the Message Bible, it says old people are distinguished by grandchildren. And children take pride in their parents. Very quickly between the two of you, what are some of the joys of being a father and a grandfather? Some of the joys. Let me start with you, uh, John. Okay. okay, thank you very much. There is an overwhelming spirit of joy and love to see the children grow, changing from little boys and girls into adolescents and graduating into adulthood. The feeling is something. You know, you see them and you know this is me. Seven different characters with their own viewpoints, their own ways of doing things, and you see yourself in each of them. That is great joy. I see my faults in them, but I see my greatest strengths also in them. That is one of the joys that I have experienced, and I continue to experience uh, as we go on. Amen. Yeah. Thank Amen. you. What for you? <clears throat> joys of being a parent and a grandparent. What for you? I'm still struggling to put on the mic. Thank you, Yao. Thank you, Brother Yao. Thank you for the privilege of being able to speak as a, a grandfather of four kids. Two boys who are teenagers and two who are just under five. And I'd like to use a testimony that uh, we witnessed last week. Elizabeth was struggling to complete a puzzle. And the four-year-old granddaughter came and said, Grandma, let me see what you're doing. And she showed her the key and left her. Minutes later, she came and said, Grandma, I've done it. And she didn't believe. I said, really? She said, yes, I have. You take great joy in seeing how smart your grandchildren can be. Then comes the challenge. Who does he take after? <laughs> <laughs> Is it the grandpa or the grandma? Well, that debate will always go on to the law calls us home and opens our mind to the understanding that it's just God's grace. Amen. And I agree with what uh, Dr. Azu has said. You see your own strengths played out in the grandchildren. You see your weaknesses also play out in the grandchildren. But I think the bottom line is this. Is there an opportunity for me to make up for some of the shortfalls that occurred as I brought up my own children? Again, another testimony. Last week, those of you who were here saw our youngest granddaughter, a year and a half. I'm about my Christian. And we had to press on this young couple, our son and our daughter-in-law, the importance of doing this. Because we said, look, you've done it for Aliyah, the older one, four years. Why don't you want, oh, when we get, they don't live here. When we get back to Canada, we'll do it and that kind of thing. They always seem to defer things. And we saw an opportunity Mm. to make sure that they set the kids on the right path. So sometimes some of the shortfalls in your own upbringing of your children, which you corrected much later, you don't want repeated in your grandchildren. And we thank the Lord for that. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I spoke about the children. Mm. I never mentioned the grandchildren. Please, please. So, 
I love those grandchildren. They give me the opportunity to spoil them <laughs> and make and make their parents jealous. <laughs> I give them chewing gum. <laughs> In retaliation for the chewing gum, which I kept seeing the fathers and mothers put on the chairs around the house, <laughs> I I get them interested in the things I like. They're very young. They're very young. The oldest is maybe four years, right? I like to spoil them. Amen. And then the greatest joy is when I see my children looking at me spoiling them <laughs> in disgust. <clears throat> it gives me great joy. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, uh, because of time, I'm going to ask two questions, but I'm going to ask one of each because, yeah, you touched on something. Uh, uh, yeah, you touched on. Um, the fact that, you know, there are lessons you missed teaching your children during their youth that you now find critical to teach your grandchildren. Can you touch on very quickly one or two as I come back to you, Dr. Zhu, on some of the key things that you have taught your children? As a husband and a father, I've been married for 45 years. Mm. People, I look people. back... <laughs> And I wonder whether I got it all right. One of the challenges of working in an institution like the Foreign Service is that you get to live in different countries. Mm. We've lived in Belgrade, Yugoslavia, we've lived in London, we've lived in Pretoria, we've lived in Denmark, we've lived in New York, we've lived in Canada. We've lived in Nigeria. So what you have is what my wife and I call third culture kids. They don't belong to your own culture. But they don't also belong to the culture of all these countries they've lived in. Mm. So they're hanging in there. They're hanging in there. And so you miss the opportunity of having them grown locally, adjusting to their local culture. And one of the challenges, particularly, is speaking to, to them in a local language which they understand, but which they are unable to communicate effectively because they're all their friends and mates are not Ghanaian. One of my friends said, oh, as for me, yeah, I don't like my children to grow up to say, as for me, yeah. But the fact of the matter that we've discovered, and when I see people in the mall speaking to their two-year-olds in English, I get closer and I say, does he speak your language? Teach the child to speak in your own language. And when their minds have been opened, to linguistics of their language, the English follows naturally. Mm. That's one of the regrets I have. Okay. Number two, one of my regrets is our oldest daughter is married to a white American, so um, they don't live locally. They come when they can. A son and daughter-in-law who had their little girl, um, <clears throat> Kristen here, live in Canada. We've been blessed to have them here for six months. And that's a blessing. And it's been a great bonding opportunity. Our daughter lives in Vancouver, dating a white guy. We're praying that she makes up her mind whether they're going to get married or not. And so you have literally three of your kids going to grow families who would end up 
continuing that third culture generation. And therefore, there is bound to be a disconnect. Yeah, you, you, your family lives in, in the UK to see you. But I was is more serious. So, <laughs> so who's going to take over all the assets that we have? Thankfully, our son, our second child, yeah, our older son, up. lives here. But we've literally been begging him to marry from home. <laughs> and that's a long debate and another story. Amen. So that's a second regret. Having kids, no matter where they're educated. And I admire Angie and uh, Minister Ken. Because your daughter came home after college and got married here. We love that. And that's what I love to see our kids do. We've missed the boat on three strands. We're praying. Pray for us. Amen. That this Amen. son will not. <laughs> All right. Okay. Dr. Azu, just in two minutes, three minutes. My question uh, is, 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 is what I said before. What are the three key values or lessons, three, that uh, you have tried to instill in your children to ensure God's purposes is, were established in their lives? Just give me three. Three we have only, of we have them. Only two minutes, yeah. One, knowing the God of the parents. We ensured that every Sunday we all went to church. We had a bus, and all of us fit in to go to church every Sunday. We insisted on that. Because we figured out that they are the only people we can take along to heaven. We we'll leave everything, but if we get them right, we'll see them in heaven. So that was our primary. Okay. All right. But the second one relates to the can do spirit. Mm. You can do all things. Mm. If I see any of them fiddling with a problem, the principal in the house is nobody helps them out. Mm. They keep doing it until they figure it out. And I always enjoy that little smile when they crack the problem. Mm. So, we put this spirit in them and today we can see that spirit being demonstrated in their lives. They Amen. can do all things. The final one, I think um, gratitude. Mm. Gratitude. Mm. You keep doing things for your children all the time. And so they become used to, used to it. They feel like it's their right, totally entitled. I used to play a trick on them when they were living abroad. If I want them to get back to me, I always send a note to them. Oh, did you get the money I was trying to send to you, <laughs> I get a response. <laughs> That's how I got them to acknowledge that for everything that they get, they should show gratitude. Amen. And they should learn the spirit of giving mm. as they are grateful to the parents and so also to God. Gratitude is it. Thank you very much. Give a hand of applause. Thank yeah. you. That I time. last point. Yeah, that's one last point. The time. So I don't go away having given the impression. The good news is that all four kids are believers. Mm -hmm. For wherever we went, we always worshipped in a family-oriented church, and but I mean a church that the kids feel welcome, adjust to programs that develop not only their spiritual mind, but also their physical and also intellectual mind. And so they are all believers, and the God's word says that I have given them eternal life. They will not perish. Amen. No one can snatch them from my hand. That's the seed, and that's Amen. important to us. And therefore, we are comforted even if we appear to have failed in some areas. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, gentlemen. A hand of applause for them, please. Thank you very much. We could have done this for a couple of days.
the next group, if you speak, really come are the fathers of uh, teens or preteens. Come on, I invite Sunny and Carl to, to join us. And I want you running, folks. I need you here quickly. Come on, people, give them, encourage them. Thank you, gentlemen, for being part of this. Now, y y you guys are, are raising what I call preteens and teens in this uh, world that, uh, if I borrow from the business world, it it's called a VUCA world. You know, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. Okay, that's, that's the VUCA. You know, an environment where traditional family values are being set aside. You know what I'm talking about. Social media is shaping our thoughts and lifestyles, right? Bombarding children with false images of what life should be like, right? That's, that is, uh, you know, the, the, the atmosphere that you guys, the season in which your children are growing up. What are some of the challenges uh, your children are facing? And as Christian fathers, how are you supporting and helping them navigate this complex world ensuring that God's purposes are fulfilled in their lives. Just one question. I'll come to you first, uh, Dr. Sunny. Thank you. Have you got it? Use this one. If... Yeah. So, Thank you, Uncle Dan. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, before I answer his question, I need to I mean, issue out a caveat here. <laughs> when he called me, I actually felt, oh, is that so? I'm a father, eh? Yeah. You know, very unworthy to be here and seated talking to you about fatherhood. But that notwithstanding, I couldn't have been a father without Sarah. So, so I think <laughs> I'm fight because, because she's made me one. So, I mean, and thanks for the question. And, and when, when you called me, the following day in my Bible reflection came Psalm 78. And the psalmist was basically saying we should give ear to the word, to his word. And the long and short of it, in verse 3, he says that they have heard and they have known what their fathers have handed over to them. Mm. And that he will not shy away from passing this on the next generation. And the question I ask myself is, Sonny, how are you passing on what the Lord has given me? And in my case, there was no father to have handed over the word of God to me. Mm. But I now have the opportunity to hand over his word to these kids. We have been contending, especially after 2020, I mean, when COVID and study online made internet more exposed to the kids. Mm -hmm. Post that, we have been navigating between ensuring that, yes, you can have the freedom to be online, but yet myself and Sarah have the responsibility of guiding them to be able to tease out what is good and what is Christian and what is not. Mm -hmm. And so um, you have this case coming back to you constantly of either a friend or a colleague doing something that they feel is not Christian and then coming back with a feedback on this. It, it just goes to say that perhaps we are doing something and bringing them up. So, um, um, ours is once in a while, though not very frequent, I must confess, opening up the word of God with them and studying the word. So basically, that I think is how we are managing the situation and much more so our own desire to try to live by the word. Mm. So even if we are not reading the word with them, they can learn from it in the way we live our Christian lives. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Carl, same question to you. Okay. For me, when you have a, a child who was born as a teenager, <laughs> <laughs> 
that's uh, that's a, a whole different ball game. Mm -hmm. You have somebody who is about ten children in one, mm. so you can understand. But for us, it's like Wofa said, it's a culture thing. And what kind of culture do we also want to pass on? We are God's children. So then we defer to the highest form of culture, which is Jesus' culture. Mm. That's that lifestyle. So that's what we would want to pass on. And that becomes the reference point for everything. Um, what's, on, what's in the media, uh, the music, um, choice of friends, where to go to, everything is guided by this Jesus culture. Mm -hmm. And it makes it easier mm -hmm. for us to make these kinds of decisions. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers uh, it, 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 that, the it, question. It. And I think that is what Jesus really wants us to defer to him in everything. Mm -hmm. And it makes it so, so much easier uh, to make choices. And when we do that, you know, it's actually based on his word, mm -hmm. then we begin to grow and thrive if I need to end it that way. Thank you, thank you very much. And very quickly, just quickly, before you go, so I give the next group an opportunity, I'm going to speak to the young fathers. You have, as you said, gave birth to a teenager, and you are also navigating this whole social media space. These chaps have just begun. One quick, you know, between yourselves, maybe two, sort of advice that you would give the young fathers of today because they are starting the journey. What, what is your quick advice that you'd give them today? Now we are dealing with artificial intelligence and it exposes the children to much, much more mm. information, being able to be creative and there's so much that's being thrown at them. Mm. So it means that they need to be grounded in, their, in the value system that would make them stand when they, they, are, they are confronted with all kinds of things. Mm. So for me, uh, that's the advice I'm going to give them. Mm. Their kind of world is going to be maybe two or three times even faster mm. than now. Mm. So there's a lot that they are going to be, content, uh, co to be contending with. But if they are grounded in those values, mm. those eternal values that don't change, mm. that give us uh, that anchoring and ensure that we have a, a sure and sound footing, then I think we are we are good. And that is based on the rock that we know, and that's Jesus. Amen. Amen. Brother Sonny. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I mean, for me, as part of reflecting on this psalm, um, what came up was the fact that churches in Europe, church buildings in Europe, are being turned into hotels and, uh, I mean, playgrounds. So the question that came to me is, how will African church look long after we are all gone? Will these church buildings be turned into something like that? So for, for those with the very young children, we have a duty. We have a responsibility. And that is to ensure that we, 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 we more or less share our faith, hand over our faith, to this youngster. Charles Spurgeon said that it's good you have Sunday school teaching your children, but the responsibility of a child's faith is in your hand mm. as a Christian parent. Mm. So that is what I will say. Mm. May God bless you. Thank you very much. A great, great applause. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. And finally, we give them five minutes. The young fathers in the house. David, where are you? Uh, John, uh, no, Kofi, and Alex. Please, uh, I would like you to rush up here just very quickly. Let's give them a round of applause. These are the young fathers in the house. Well, uh, we don't have much time, but uh, just, I just have one question for you guys. You've heard from our grandfathers, you've heard from our other fathers who have, start, uh, who have been on this journey. You have just started the journey, so your question really is about lessons learned. What are some of the lessons and values you have learned and plan to incorporate into your role as Christian fathers? I will start with you, David. 
Just give me one. We haven't got much time. So just give me one that you picked up today that you say, hmm, this is something that I will incorporate. Um, good morning, church. So um, something I picked was they should be grounded in God. Mm. But um, another thing they didn't say, but I inferred. Was, in, was inferred, yeah. Was that... It's, it's a new lawyer, people. So that's... Uh, it's, uh, this is a new lawyer, just... Uh, yeah. Was that actually all the fathers were present so mm. they can tell you the experiences they've had mm. with their um, children mm. so i think um, that's the main, main lesson, I think. yes excellent thank you very much kofi <laughs> pass him the mic is it working yes. it's working all right so um uncle danny the the take off everything they said for me was being intentional mm. um these fathers were intentional mm in everything that they wanted their kids to grow to become. Mm. And I, I am saying that in this world we are now, even our time is more crucial mm. because of how the world is becoming today. We cannot get it wrong. Mm. And so um, be, it, be it loving the kids, be it disciplining them, we have to be intentional about it. Mm. And that's something that we cannot um, 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 get it wrong. Thank you very much. Intentional. Thank you. Alex T. Good morning, church. Thank you, Uncle Danny. Well, for me, I believe if a father wants to be there for his family, one thing he has to do first is take good care of himself. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not healthy, how are you going to show love? are you going to communicate to your children? So first thing is take good care of yourself. So because a healthy life for yourself will definitely reflect in your family and in your children. Mm -hmm. And the last one is communication. Let your, you know, I understand that they are free with them. Mm -hmm. They allow them to talk because the moment they are timid, they can't express themselves. Mm -hmm. Issues will happen that they can't, you know, say to anybody and that way, constitute a different nature mm. to that to that to that to that kid mm. so that's my understanding thank you very much thank you thank you guys thank you guys come on let's give them a round of applause i think they did well amen so thank you i will i will just close by saying this to the fathers and potential fathers love god personally learn the truth inwardly and lead your children diligently so love God personally which is about your connectedness and intimacy with God will appeal to your children learn the truth inwardly just means for yourself get wisdom get understanding get the revelation of the world it will guide you lead your children diligently well most of you know leadership starts with you leadership starts with you the father learn to lead you and then you will begin to have the right and the ability to lead others, including your children. I end with an old Japanese saying, relevant to today. It says, one generation plants the trees, and the next generation gets the shade. Fathers, our job is to plant the trees, so our children can get the shade. So I ask, as I often do, what kind of trees are we planting today? What kind of shade will your children have? What shade will they have to protect them against the harsh rays of influence of this dysfunctional societies? Societies, as we know, that are diametrically opposed to God's principles. 
What trees, what shade are we providing? Now, as Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What about you? Thank you. God bless you.